Happy Hauntings Horror fans, let's go back to 1959. You receive an invitation to a party. If you stay at this party all night, you'll receive $10,000 in the morning. However, there is one catch. The house is haunted. Do you have what it takes to stay at the house on Haunted Hill? That's right, party goers. This week, we're going to chat about the original House on Haunted Hill. So this film was released in black and white, and then the film was also redone in 1999 in color with a new cast. I personally love the 1959 version in black and white. The scares seem better. This is the way they were intended. The color version is great, but something about the black and white picture with the music and acting styles just complete the whole story for me. So without further ado, let's jump into this week's episode. The summary of the movie is basically how I described it in the intro, an eccentric billionaire invites people to stay overnight in a haunted house and anyone who makes it through the night will get $10,000 in the morning. As always, there will be spoilers throughout the podcast, so listen at your own risk. House on Haunted Hill was directed by William Castle. He had wanted to be a director his whole life. He actually financed his first movie, Macabre, by mortgaging his own house. He loved gimmicks and theatrics, and so with the movie Macabre, he came up with the idea to give every customer a certificate for a $1,000 life insurance policy from Lloyd's of London in case they should die of fright during the film. He stationed nurses in the lobbies of the theaters and hearses parked outside to kind of give e even more uh, spooky effect to people going to see Macabre, and it was a total hit. Alfred Hitchcock decided to make Psycho after noting the financial successes of 1950s B-movies that were made by William Castle and Roger Corman. House on Haunted Hill was written by Rob White. He was a great writer. He wrote screenplays and he wrote for TV. White and Castle turned out five movies together. They worked together on Macabre, 13 Ghosts, Homicidal, The Tingler, and House on Haunted Hill. Both The Tingler and House on Haunted Hill featured Vincent Price, who was very, very popular at the time. And that will take us into our cast breakdown. The fantastic Vincent Price is the character of Frederick Lauren. He is the eccentric billionaire who invites everyone to the party. He appeared in more than 100 films during his career and has two stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. He is known as the King of Macabre. He's a character actor in many cult movies like The Fly, House on Haunted Hill, Return of the Fly, The Tingler, and so many more. He's also known for his iconic voice. Prince narrated several animated films, radio dramas, and documentaries, as well as the monologue on Michael Jackson's song Thriller, which is where I first heard of him. Uh, Price was also an art collector and art consultant with a degree in art history. He lectured and wrote books on the subject. The Vincent Price Art Museum at East Los Angeles College is named in his honor. He was also a noted gourmet cook in his spare time. He just sounds like a super interesting guy. He's one of those people that if I could invite anyone to a dinner party, dead or alive, he would be at the top of my list because he just sounded like a really interesting guy. Next, we have Carol Omhart, who is Annabelle Lauren, the wife of Vincent Price's character, Frederick and over the duration of her career, she would appear in several notable horror films and film noirs, including lead roles in The Wild Party in 1956 and William Castle's House on Haunted Hill. Um, she lived a lot of her life in Seattle, and Paramount Pictures promoted her as the next Marilyn Monroe when she got started in acting. Next, we have Lance Schroeder, played by Richard Long. He plays a jet pilot in the movie, and he had three leading roles on ABC television series, including The Big Valley, Night Nanny and the Professor, and Bourbon Street Beat. Alan Marshall plays Dr. David Tennant, a psychiatrist. He got his start on Broadway and had a really great career, was in a ton of supporting roles in both television and movies. Our other leading lady was Carolyn Craig. She plays Nora Manning, who was a worker in one of Frederick's factories. He didn't know her personally. He really didn't know any of these people personally, aside from his wife when he invited them to this party. So Carolyn made her film debut in the movie Giant, in 1956 as Lacey Linton and had a lead role in the 1957 film noir Portland Exposé as Ruth Madison. She was also the second female lead in the 1958 western Apache Territory. Then we will jump to Elijah Cook Jr. who plays Watson Pritchard. Watson's brother actually passed away in the house and so he knows the ins and outs of all of the ghosts and everyone who has died there. Uh, Elijah is famed for his work in film noirs. He was typecast as the cheerful, brainy type character until he played a babyface killer in the 1941 version of the Maltese Falcon. He went on to play deceptively mild-mannered villains 
uh, very, very good in that role. His acting career spanned more than 60 years, and he worked in movies The Big Sleep, Shane, The Killing, House on Haunted Hill, and Rosemary's Baby. Next, we have Julie Mitchum, who played Ruth Bridgers, who is a reporter in the film. This is perhaps Mitchum's most notable role. She also played in The Ten Commandments, as well as The High and Mighty with John Wayne. Mitchum was also a musician, singing and playing piano in nightclubs, and during World War II, she entertained military personnel overseas. And in the early 1950s, she had her own program on KLAC-TV in Los Angeles, which is pretty cool. Then we have Liana Anderson, who has a brief but very striking appearance as Miss Slides. She was in a lot of silent films, she appeared in several films for SNC Studios without much success beginning in 1914. In 1915, she appeared in a film with Charlie Chaplin called In the Park. And in 1953, she revived her career in music, billing herself as the world's most horrible singer. And she went on to record the album Music to Suffer By on Unique Records in 1957, which is really cool. She was a really big kind of comedic actor on a lot of late night shows, and she'd go on and perform her terrible singing. And then our last but not least is Jonas Slides, who is played by Howard Hoffman, and I could not find any more information on him, so this may be his only role, but, you know, he played it well, I guess, so good job, Howard. Now let's jump into the film and the scene-by-scene -scene breakdown. Classic opening scene opens with nothing but screaming, specifically female screaming. You can really tell it's that, like, fear-driven kind of blood-curdling scream and laughing. That's it. No picture, no nothing, black screen, screaming and laughing, which automatically is a great star for any horror film, especially one from this day and age. Next, we get to meet the character of Watson Pritchard for the first time, and it's just his floating head in the middle of the black screen. And he talks about the house on Haunted Hill, and he specifically is talking to the audience. He's really breaking that wall. Um, and he talks about how seven people have died in the house, including his brother, and that Frederick, Vincent Price's character, rented the house for his wife so that she can throw a party. The guests show up in hearses. They each got their own hearse to be escorted to the property. Um, we kind of get to meet a little bit about each of the characters. Lance is a pilot. He needs money. Ruth is a reporter. She gambles and needs the money. And she also is really wanting to write a story about ghosts in the afterlife. Um, Watson has already spent time in the house, which is partly why he was invited. Uh, Dr. Trent is a psychiatrist and really wants to explore hysteria and kind of what fear does to the mind. And Nora is a worker in one of Frederick's factories, and he knows that she needs the money, and so she was also invited. Um, the guests kind of get out of their respective hearses and are kind of standing in the front of the property together, and they walk in together without really talking, just kind of slowly meandering up to the front door. So one thing that I really like about this movie is this opening kind of scene where we see the house for the first time. You don't see the cast walk into the house, you see the camera enter the house first. So the door opens and it just pans right in through the threshold of the doorway, which is really cool. And then there's an above shot where we get to see all of the guests walk into what I guess would be the lounge area slash living room. And there's dust and cobwebs on everything, which just adds to the whole ghost haunted house ambiance. The guests start to introduce themselves to each other. Nobody knows each other. Nobody knows this Frederick Lauren person who invited them there. All they know is that he's had many wives, four or five. They're not totally sure, but they know that he's been married a few times. And right as they're kind of chatting and getting to know each other, the door slams shut and the chandelier in the entry room falls from the ceiling and nearly crushes Nora and Lance saves her. And this kind of starts this whole flirty interaction, um, very much supportive partnership role that those two have with each other. Um, they're very kind of coupley. They talk a lot throughout the film. Um, and so we'll kind of see that as the film progresses. And then we jump up to the upstairs of the, ha the house and Vincent and his wife are chatting and she says that she doesn't want to go to the party. She's upset that he invited strangers. This isn't the kind of party that she wanted. She says that he's jealous and he says that he picked each guest for a reason. He just wants to test people who needs money. He is so rich. He just kind of sees this whole thing as a game. They clearly don't get along. 
the marriage is not pleasant. She says that she hasn't poisoned the champagne because he makes a reference to her having poisoned him in the past. And she basically says, no, it was just food poisoning. Like the doctor, you know, said that you were fine. And he's like, yeah, that's, you know, that's exactly what you wanted him to think. So there's some confrontation there. She says that he's the only ghoul in the house, and then Watson starts scaring the other guests, talking about how people have died in the house and how his brother was murdered in the house, um, just kind of really getting the ghost topics right out in the open and really just trying to kind of spook everybody a little bit. Frederick comes downstairs and lets the guests know that the caretakers are going to lock them in at midnight, and so everyone has until midnight to decide if they're going to stay for the evening or if they're going to leave. However, if they leave at midnight with the caretakers, they will not be getting the $10,000 that they were basically promised. This is when Watson Pritchard tells them that four men and three women were murdered in the house, and Frederick invited four men and three women to the party. Watson gives the tour and starts describing each one of the murders, where they happened, how they happened, that whole thing. He says that a man killed his wife in the basement by throwing her into a vat of acid, and the acid vat is still in the basement. They throw a dead rat that they find in there to test it because they're unsure if it's just water or if it's still the acid. And you see the whole thing just kind of disintegrate until there's just the little tiny rat skeleton left. Nora and Lance kind of stay in the basement after everyone leaves and they're chatting about winning the money and how odd the whole thing is. And they're walking around the basement and checking things out when Lance goes into a room in the basement and the door closes behind him, leaving Nora in the basement by herself. The lights go out and she sees the ghost of the wife who was murdered, or so she thinks. She runs off to find the others and to get help for Lance because supposedly he's stuck in this other room. She finds them and brings them back to the basement as quickly as possible, and Lance is passed out in the room that he went into. His head is bleeding, and he has no idea what happened to him, and Watson is pretty convinced that a ghost hit him. He is just fueling this ghost spooky fire all evening, saying, they don't want us here, they're marking each one of us, he was hit by, you know, he being Lance was hit by one of the ghosts. He didn't just fall and hit his head, he was targeted for a reason. The whole time they make these ghosts out to be very, very aggressive. So then Dr. Trent, the psychiatrist, kind of bandages Lance up, makes sure that the bleeding has stopped and he's all good to go. And Nora tells them kind of what it was that she saw, that she saw this ghost woman, the who she thinks is the wife um, that was murdered by her husband in the basement. And while she's telling that story and after she's telling that story, most of them get more drinks. Um, there's a lot of drinking going on in this party, and most of them are drinking scotch ands. And I was wondering what a scotch and was, because that's all they say is, oh, I'll have a scotch and. And I'm like, and what? Apparently, a really common drink back then was scotch and soda water, which sounds kind of terrible. So that's a fun fact for you. I don't know why people drink that, but some people drink really gross stuff. So you know, or hey, maybe it is good and I just need to try it. So Lance and Nora decide to go back down to the basement and investigate. They've got these candles that they take with them instead of just flipping on the lights like normal people would. Um, and they kind of want to go and investigate what exactly happened to Lance because he got shut in that room and she couldn't get the door open. And so they're going to go down and check it out. They think there has to be a hidden room and that someone came into that room that he got trapped in and hit him upside the head and then left via that secret doorway or that secret passage that they think could be in that room. So Nora runs into the ghost woman again while Lance is in that room kind of looking for a hidden door. She's in another room kind of on the other side of the wall, I guess, to that. Like a, there's a shared wall in between the two rooms. And so she's on the other side and she sees the ghost woman again. And this is a pretty good jump scare. Like she comes out of nowhere. You're like waiting because Lance is basically knocking on the wall, trying to find like where there's a hollow spot where there could be the secret door. And so you're waiting for this knocking to come. And then all of a sudden in this dark, and I think that's why they have the candles is so that the jump scares even like more intense. But Nora turns around and all you see in the candlelight is this woman's terrifying face. Like all just funky looking with the candlelight. It makes it look even more scary. Super, super decent jump scare. And that's why I think that the black and white version is better because 
watching this scene in color versus in black and white, the black and white gives much more of the shadow effect, I feel like, in my opinion, than the color version. Um, so Nora runs to get Lance because she's freaking out. She's like, the ghost came back. It's that same woman. And Lance kind of is a jerk. And I was like, I really don't believe you because I would have seen it. Like, I would have seen this woman walk past me. She wouldn't have been able to get out of here without me seeing her. And Nora's really upset because she's like, now I've seen this woman twice and nobody believes me. And she feels kind of like she's going crazy. So she gets upset because of this and she runs out of the basement, basically leaving Lance by himself. And she runs to the second story of the house. So she passes like where the living room is, goes upstairs. And here she meets Annabelle, the uh, wife of Frederick's kid. And so Annabelle takes her into her room and they kind of have a chat. Annabelle basically interrogates Nora about how long she has known Frederick and warns her not to wander the house by herself. She says that she shouldn't trust her husband. She kind of almost accuses Nora and Frederick of having an affair. And Nora's like, I promise I really did not know him until today. Like he said that he knew about my story because her uh, family was like in an accident or whatever. And so she's the only one in the family now making money and supporting her parents. Just super lovely person, she seems like. Annabelle says that everyone at the party is in danger and uh, tells Nora to wait in her room by herself and not to come out until um, just before midnight so that she can leave with the caretakers. So as Annabelle leaves Nora in her room, she runs into Lance in the hallway and, and she shows him to his room as well. They start talking about Nora and how frightened she was. And Lance is like, yeah, you know, I think I made her upset. And they kind of chat about why Nora would be upset. And Annabelle's very flirty with Lance for someone who has just met him and asks if I can, you know, if she can count on him and if he'll make sure that she's safe and all this stuff. She thinks that her husband is planning something, but she doesn't know what. And then she says that she thinks that her husband has killed his first three wives and that she's going to be next. So she's kind of setting up this whole story about, oh, I think I'm going to be murdered tonight. Can I count on you to like protect me and make sure he doesn't get away with this, which is a lot to put on somebody that you just met literally two minutes ago. It's very intense. And Lance, of course, is the you know, he's the stereotypical kind of strong man in the story. He's like, of course, like, I'll do my best. I'll do whatever I can to keep you and Nora safe. You can count on me. Very gentlemanly, gentlemanly guy. So then Annabelle runs back to her room before her husband finds her, like, out and about chatting with the other guests. And Frederick comes into what I guess would be their room and is trying to convince her to come down. He's being really rude, though. He pulls her by her hair. Um, basically until she agrees to calm down. Very toxic. Frederick is not a good guy. That's for sure. He keeps saying that it's her party and that this everything is for her and she should be thankful. He's acting very cryptic and very kind of creepy. Um, Frederick goes down to tell everybody that it's almost midnight and they'll be gathering in the living room to kind of decide who's going to stay for the night and who's going to go with the caretakers. Um, Nora goes to kind of get something out of one of her overnight bags that she brought and she finds a like severed head inside of her bag. And this kind of calls back to one of the stories that Watson Pritchard was telling is that um, two of the people who are murdered in the house, they only found their bodies. They've never found the heads. And so the heads are supposedly floating around in the house somewhere. And so the idea is, is that the youth, they find one of these heads in Nora's bag. But clearly somebody put it there because she didn't bring the severed head from this person who died years ago to this party. If, you know, if you can't, which what I'm saying. It was planted there by the murderer or by a murderer. So she ultimately gets frightened and leaves her room, even though Annabelle told her not to. And as she's walking down the hallway, you see this arm come out from this little alcove area and like grab her around the mouth, basically, you know, that like kidnapping kind of style, I guess you could say, and tells her he's going to try and kill you. You need to leave. So she's screaming, runs downstairs, and is basically telling Lance that she is not staying in the house. She is leaving as soon as possible, and she's trying to convince Lance to go with her. So then at this point, everyone's in the living room, and this is when she's kind of having this, um, I guess it's, it's supposed to look like an outburst, you know, having this outburst of, I'm not staying in this house a second longer, I'm leaving, you guys all need to come with me, this place is terrible, blah, blah, blah. 
Frederick is also talking about how it's almost midnight. The caretakers will be leaving soon. You guys need to decide. And then the caretakers walk into the like living room area or they're standing just outside the, the entryway into the living room. And you realize that the ghost that Nora has been seeing in the basement is actually the female caretaker. It's the caretaker's wife and she's blind. And so that's why her eyes look the way they do. That's why she never said anything because she never saw Nora and was able to say, oh, no, honey, it's okay. Um, yeah, so that's, you're like, all right, so that's, I, I mean, spooky and uncomfortable, but I guess an excusable thing. As people are trying to decide whether or not they want to stay or leave, the caretakers leave without taking anyone with them. They don't let people make the choice. The caretakers leave early, like five minutes early, without giving anyone the chance to say, yes, I want to go with you. So now everyone is stuck in the house overnight because the caretakers have locked them in, which was part of the plan in the beginning. The caretakers were going to lock them in until sunrise. As people are kind of getting a little bit on edge, Annabelle tells her husband, Frederick, you need to get cars for all of these people. Let them go home, pay them. This is getting kind of ridiculous. And he basically says, no, we're not going to ruin your party. Like, this is for you. We're not going to, you know, we're not going to ruin your party. Uh, he then passes out party favors in these little itty bitty coffins. And he's giving everyone a pistol for safety, quote unquote, for the night. Which like, yeah, that's great. Nora's already freaked out of her mind. Let's give her a gun. Absolutely not. Clearly, this is an American film because this stuff would not happen in Europe. So he hands these out, and this just can definitely not be a good sign. He gives one to Annabelle and jokes that she may want to use it on him before the night ends. So after everyone takes their party favor in terms of a pistol, uh, Nora tells everyone that she found a severed head in her suitcase and is kind of being very matter-of-fact of like, well, do you want to see one of those severed heads that hasn't been found? So she takes everyone upstairs to her room, and of course... There's nothing in her suitcase. When she opens it up, the head is now gone, and it's just her clothes inside. Trent asks Nora if she wants a sedative, but Nora yells at them to get out. She's very upset. She's very confused. Watson thinks that the ghosts are getting to her and basically says that they're messing with her mind on purpose, and Lance thinks that someone should stay with her. Ruth is going to stay in her own room, but said she would kind of keep an eye out on Nora and help her out if they needed her. Trent tells Frederick to stop scaring Nora because he assumes that he's behind the whole thing. So then after a, a few minutes, Lance goes to check on Nora and her room is completely empty, but there is a severed head hanging in her closet. It's clearly not hers. It's clearly supposed to be like an old old kind of decaying severed head. Uh, this is when you hear blood curdling screams and Lance finds a woman hanging from the rafters. And so originally at first you think it's Nora because of everything that's happened. She's super scared. She's finding these severed heads and then they're gone. Nobody's believing her. All of these things. You think that it's going to be Nora. So Trent and Lance take the body down, they take it to an empty room, and they lay it in bed, and this is when you see that it's actually Annabelle. And so Lance finds Nora hiding throughout the house, and she is asking for help. She says that Frederick tried to kill her. When Lance asks how he tried to kill her or how you know that, she said it was dark, but that she knew it was him. She was for sure it was him. Lance tells her that Annabelle is dead, and Lance tells Nora to lock herself in her room and not to come out. You see Frederick come out of a room at the end of the hall and check on his dead wife. He sees Watson and starts to strangle him in the room because Watson's kind of like standing there being really creepy and clearly Frederick is quote unquote trying to grieve and so he starts strangling Watson because I don't know grief is a grief is a terrible monster and anger is a terrible thing so you know I guess when you're upset that upset about something happening maybe you just strangle the first person you see I don't know. Uh, so Frederick is demanding to know why Watson's in the room anyway, uh, almost like they have a secret relationship that maybe Frederick didn't know about. He tells him to leave and not come back. He doesn't want to see Watson in his wife's room or anywhere near his wife. Um, and so once the rest of the guests are in the living room, they talk about trying to leave. They're trying to figure out how they can get out, if they can break a window, if they can break the doors, if they can do something and get out because they're all just uncomfortable. A woman has now died. Clearly, it's it's a recipe for the disaster. This party is over. Kind of never really started in the first place. Watson basically 
tears the whole idea down. He's like, it's not happening. These doors are reinforced with steel. There's bars on the windows. Absolutely nobody's getting out. It's not happening. So Trent talks about how things have been so bad already and they still have six hours left in the house. They've only been in the house for a little bit. Someone's already dead. This is not a good sign. Uh, And people are really curious as to why and how Annabelle killed herself because there was nothing to climb up to like the rafter that she hung. Like how would she have gotten up somewhere to like jump off? There was nothing, you know, nothing that she could have used to get up that high anyway and kind of successfully be able to do that. And so Frederick thinks that his wife was murdered by one of the guests, but they all think that it was him. Frederick basically just throws that idea away. He's like, well, why would I do that here? And why would I do it in that way? Like, there's way better ways to to do that, which is not, that's not really a boat of confidence, my guy. But, you know, Um, so what started as a silly party has probably progressed into murder. It's a very, very dramatic scene. Everyone's kind of accusing each other, uh, or not each other, but the, the party goers are accusing Frederick and Frederick thinks that it's one of them. But what they do know is one person is guilty, and the rest are innocent. Uh, So Lance basically has the idea that if he goes to his room and he shoots anyone that comes in, um, he'll be safe. And basically this makes everyone agree to stay in their rooms for the night. Everyone's like, if we stay in our rooms, no one else will die because everyone will be in their rooms. And if somebody does come out of their room, probably trying to cause trouble, it'll be really easy to figure it out because that'll be the only one up walking around outside their room. They all agree to kind of stay in their rooms for the night and hopefully just let things pass so they can get out here in about six hours. Watson basically is, again, a downer. He's like, it doesn't make any difference. It's not going to help anything. The ghosts are going to get us. We're all screwed. So everyone at this point is in their rooms for the night. Um, We go to Dr. Trent. We really haven't spent a whole lot of time with him so far in the movie. And he's just kind of hanging out in his room, and you see the door handle start moving, like someone's trying to get in. And so he goes to the door. He's got his weapon. And he opens it, but nobody's there. So, like, that's a little creepy. Ghosts is what, you know, ghosts. House is haunted. No big deal. So, Ruth is in her room hanging out. She's got her little vodka soda thingy, or scotch scotch soda, not vodka soda. That's a normal thing. And more blood falls onto her hand, like it did when they were going through the tour. So, that kind of makes her a little bit uneasy. Lance checks on Nora, and they're talking about the murder. They think that it's Frederick. They're super excited to get out of the house. They just want to be done. Um, at this point, there's, like, thunder and lightning that starts happening outside. And Lance says that he's done in the house. He's going to break out and go for help. He's going to find a way out. He tells Nora to lock herself in and that he'll come back to get her if he finds a way out. But to stay in, don't make noise. Um, You know, he doesn't want Frederick to know where she is because they think that Frederick tried to murder her. And so Lance finds a hidden passage that seems to kind of swallow him. Like he, it's, it's in the hallway. He goes in and the door closes behind him and he can't get out. So Nora's pacing in her room and the lights go out. You're like, okay, it's storming outside. No big deal. But, you know, everyone's on edge possible haunted house, definitely spooky. And so at this point, there's probably the biggest scare in the movie is a rope kind of like comes up in through the window in Nora's room and wraps around her ankles. And so this is, you know, if you're watching this nowadays, it's going to seem really cheesy and kind of cliche. It's not done super well because back then they didn't have super cool technology to You make everything work or just CGI rope around her ankles. And so it moves kind of funny, but nonetheless, it wraps around her ankles. She starts freaking out and she sees what she thinks is the ghost of Annabelle outside her window with a noose around her neck. Not hanging. She's just like floating and the noose is like hanging down her body kind of. You know, it's not like tight and the rope is going up. It's just hanging down. She, you know, kind of floats toward the window, freaks Nora out, and then floats away and takes the rope with her. It, like, untangles around Nora's legs and just disappears like it was never there. As quickly as it came, it was gone. So Nora didn't know that that was how she died. She, she, Lance didn't tell her that, that she was hung. And so Nora leaves her room scared and she sees Annabelle hanging again from the rafters. But they had put her in bed. But she, there she is, hanging from the rafters. And so as she kind of backs into this wall from around the corner, this hand goes and tries to grab Nora. Poor Nora is just having 
a heck of a time. And then the piano downstairs starts playing eerie music all on its own as she runs into the living room looking for Lance. Everything is just a big no from me. This is not good at all. So Nora's running through the house just screaming. And you wonder how the other guests in the house don't hear it because she's just screaming so loud. We see Frederick is getting ready to leave his room and Dr. Trent is on his way down the hallway to see Frederick because Dr. Trent heard organ music and someone walking. He didn't hear the screaming. Supposedly he heard music and someone walking. So they agree to split up and look for clues, please, basically. Scooby-Doo style. They're really just going to split up and see if someone needs help. But um, Dr. Trent goes to see Annabelle And this is when you find out that Annabelle is actually not dead, which you had kind of suspected when you saw her hanging from the uh, rafters again and when she appeared outside Nora's window. Like, you kind of had that little inkling of maybe she's not dead, but she's not dead. And she clearly knows Dr. Trent from outside of the house. Um, They clearly have a little relationship. And so Dr. Trent goes to check on Annabelle and tells her that the whole thing's almost over. She opens her eyes and you learn that they basically plan this whole thing together. They have her in this like hanging harness that they, have you know, hasn't brought any harm to her doing that stuff. They basically drove her to hysteria so that Nora ends up accidentally killing Frederick with the gun. She is at her wit's end. She is struggling hardcore and she will shoot the first thing that she sees. And so um, Nora goes into the cellar and is scared and screaming still. She shoots Frederick, just as planned. And so then basically their plan was to put Frederick in the vat of acid that's in the basement that he showed them at the beginning of the party. And so the lights go out and you hear a splash of the acid and noise. And the plan was for Annabelle to come down after the acid part was over. She was just kind of going to stay out of it. And so when she comes in, she walks to the vat of acid because the room is empty and she's like wondering where Dr. Trent is. And at this moment, a skeleton comes floating basically out of the vat of acid. And this is another like pretty good, pretty good spook factor. Again, pretty cheesy by today's standards, but all in all, not bad. And again, looks better in black and white as opposed to color. So the skeleton rises up out of the vat and starts floating toward Annabelle. And Frederick's voice is telling her that he's going to take her with him. He's like, you are not going to get away with this. I'm going to take you with me. Like, if you're going to murder me, you're coming too. And so the skeleton is kind of floating around the room after her and ends up kind of getting her turned around. And she ends up falling backwards into the vat of acid herself and dies. And this is when you learn that Frederick was actually alive and well the whole time, and he was able to push Dr. Trent in the vat. And he had this skeleton on this, like, pulley system, almost like a marionette doll, and was hiding in the corner the whole time, you know, making it follow Annabelle so that she would hopefully fall into the vat of acid. And so the other guests all come down at this point. They've rescued Lance. They heard him in the wall. They got him down, and they go into the basement And this is when you find out that Nora's gun actually was full of blanks. This is because Frederick had a feeling that his wife was cheating on him and had a feeling that it was with Dr. Trent, which was why he invited Dr. Trent. And so you realize that even though Dr. Trent and Annabelle had this whole master plan, Frederick was kind of two steps ahead of the both of them. He tells the others of Annabelle and Dr. Trent's plan and basically says, you know, I'm ready for the courts to decide whatever the punishment is, you know, they were going to kill me and I, I ended up, you know, beating them to it type of deal. And so this is kind of where the movie ends. The movie ends with a close up of Watson saying, there are nine now, they're coming for me next, and then they will come for you. And the very end shot is the camera coming backward out of the front door, like it's backing out of the house. And so I really love how At the beginning of the movie, you get just Watson's face talking to the audience. And then you get the same thing at the end of the movie. It's Watson closing things out, leaving the audience with one little on edge of, they're coming for me next, and then they will come for you. And then we exit the house. And that is the end of House on Haunted Hill. Okay, so this is such a great movie. I love the whole kind of revenge idea, and they really set the whole thing up for it being Frederick the whole time. And then when you find out that Annabelle's alive, 
and Dr. Trent was kind of masterminding, I'm guessing the whole thing with Nora because he was really interested in kind of the hysteria and so I'm sure he had done research and so he kind of knew exactly what buttons to push for Nora to make her really on edge and uncomfortable. And so I really love that whole idea. It's kind of, it's almost a whodunit, but not really because it ends up being the person who quote unquote was murdered in the beginning is actually one half of a killer duo, which is always interesting to find out. Um, I think it's really interesting that, um, at least in my mind, Dr. Trent is kind of the, the hands that you see kind of coming out after Nora. He's the one putting the heads in places. I do wonder how he got the heads though. You know, because he's a doctor, so like does he have access to like a medical school where he got heads? Are they fake heads? Like where do the heads come from? They never answer us that. Love that idea. And so kind of back to the gimmicks that I talked about with the, with the director. Um, so during the scene where the skeleton rises up out of the vat of acid, they would actually have, when this movie first came out in theaters, skeletons swing down into the audience um, with like glowing red eyes and I wish so bad that I could go back in time and see this movie in theaters and have like the skeleton come down. And I think that that would just be so super interesting and cool to experience. Definitely next level horror that I kind of wish that we could do nowadays. I'm sure people would sue theaters and stuff, but it would be so cool to see like spooky stuff pop up in the theater while you're there to get, get people even more scared. And then one of the last, but certainly not least things that I want to mention is the score of this film. Um, so the music was written by Richard Kane, Richard Loring, and Von Dexter. They did such an amazing job. The main theme for the movie, when you first see the house, is so good. The score is amazing. If you're a music fan and you like listening to movie scores while you're doing work or whatever, I know I do, um, definitely give this one a shot. It's really good. 10 out of 10. They did amazing jobs. Um, you know, this, this is, I think, one of the biggest movies that all three of them had a hand in working on. When looking into all three of them, this is the biggest piece that all of the websites kind of refer back to. So I couldn't talk about the movie without talking about the score and giving them their much-deserved props for that. All right, party goers, I think that that is all that I have for you on this week's episode of Megan's Murder Movies. Exciting news, we are now on Spotify podcast and Apple podcast, so, you know, give us a like if you like the podcast. Please rate, review, and subscribe. That always helps us out and is much appreciated. I hope everyone stays safe out there and stay spooky, and I will see you guys in the next